Okay, very good morning to you. Uh, my name is Anthony Chung. I'm the head of market analysis here at Amplify Trading in London. It's Wednesday, the 10th of June, so I'm going to get you up to speed, hopefully, of everything that's happened both overnight and the general outlook for today. Don't forget on uh, YouTube if you are watching this or however other means you are accessing this video, just let me know uh, and I'll put in YouTube in the description of the video the link to the registration for tonight's uh, kind of exclusive online session that we're going to be doing myself and the team for the FOMC this evening. So feel free to join us. It's limited to 500 spots on the, the private Zoom link and it's a first come first serve basis. So hopefully you can join us then for the live release. But just looking over the markets and I guess starting off with this heat map I've got in front of me. This is the close on the S&P 500 from yesterday and you can see the tech giants still supporting this equity market recovery after what did look like a momentary blip off the, a bit of profit taking perhaps from those all-time highs that we were hitting in the Nasdaq and with those headlines of course where we had kind of erased the year-to-date losses from the from the pandemic in the likes of the S&P and so on. Uh, Apple shares you can see up 3.16% so very much so outperforming the market uh, the Nasdaq in fact briefly topping 10,000 uh, Apple shares being supported by news it's preparing to announce a shift in its own main processors in its Mac computers from Intel um, to its own uh, at its annual developer conference and that helping support the company's shares but the big tech giants which we know proportionately make up such a phenomenally large amount of the index uh, just helping prop things up and, and once again the Nasdaq seeing a little bit of outperformance. Uh, but looking at the cross asset class mix this morning, um, it was interesting yesterday. Um, we were talking at the time, we, I was having a chat very early in the morning uh, to some of the traders and, and we were seeing this pressure that was coming in. We eventually broke through that area of previous uh, resistance and markets ran down quite aggressively. And as we were talking um, during the morning and we were down at these, this level, um, you know, Sam and I were commenting to the guys that we were like, well, look, you know, when you get such overwhelmingly kind of sensational positive news in the headline and we hit these kind of milestones like a, a year to date reversal or an all time high in the case of the Nasdaq, it's not unusual to see some people just taking some off at these types of levels. So a bit of profit taking perhaps um, materializing is not particularly unusual and we were saying you know above or beyond that point we still remain very confident that the trend as it exists at this point in time which has been this kind of continuous grind higher we don't really see that dissipating anytime soon and this was as the market was falling uh, which a couple of the guys the more the more junior traders were kind of questioning uh, you know how how do you kind of formulate that view and it was more to do with the the function that yesterday there wasn't really much in a way of a singular um, headline driving price activity it was a little bit more behavioral in my point of view and when it's like that I think that was exactly the type of movement that you you quite typically see which is kind of exhaustion in the very short term profit taking the market comes back down uh, and then if anything, it gives up other people more reason to just get along again, and we see the um, the bounce as we've seen so many times before. Um, given that, then, as I've said before, there has been a relative inverse correlation between um, risk being reflected when equities are generally moving higher, the dollar goes weaker, and the dollar just continues to weaken at this point. The Dixie coming quite close to a, a 96 even kind of handle at the moment and that is continuing to support these major currency pairs. Um, when I look at euro dollar here this morning and I put it back onto those longer time frames on the weekly, you know, we're right up to that ECB spike high um, that we saw last week when we had the additional ECB German kind of top up to stimulus, both fiscal and monetary. And we saw the euro appreciation, which in itself is a kind of counterintuitive move to the usual response. But given the fact that authorities backstopping then um, the economy from it deteriorating further and also assisting the economic recovery post um, the coronavirus pandemic, that was all seen as a positive and the kind of risk premium coming out of the dollar, which continues to happen. So quite interested to see. You know, we are right back up to that point, you know, the 200 DMA, the long-term trend line going back to the beginning of 2018, 
uh, is being tested once again. And as we've talked about before, any break above this uh, with a more with more force and conviction than don't really see too much getting in its way from a technical perspective until we get up to around the 115 mark over the, the kind of more medium term. Uh, when it comes to cable, it's kind of a similar story. I mean, there's there's definitely a little bit of, you know, talking to a couple of the guys yesterday, perhaps a little bit of apprehension kicking in to a certain degree because we know that there's this looming deadline in Britain with Europe in order to come to some kind of uh, deal at this point or otherwise uh, request an extension to the present transition period which is due to elapse at the end of the year um, but cable just keeps rising at this point uh, so we've managed to to get above a, a relatively key area so you can see here the the kind of fib retracement from the December high to the the, the low that we printed in the middle of March as we've gone through that 618 fib retracement now which was also the rejection of that high I'm um, looking at a weekly candle here so last week which was also for two weeks a, a strong support level back in late Feb early March so quite interested to see how this performs uh, at the moment I would say despite all the British politics going on um, the popularity kind of levels in opinion polls for Boris taking a bit of a beating uh, upon the kind of dealing and handling of the pandemic and the, the kind of speed of which the government went into lockdown. That's all kind of been overwhelmed at the moment by just the ongoing weakness in the in the greenback more than anything else. Nothing really particularly concrete from a uh, an ec macroeconomic point of view from the UK that's looking particularly positive. It's just the dollar movement at the moment helping accelerate this. Um, what this does mean though um, over the next coming weeks that could become quite interesting is just given the strong recovery we've had in the pound going from around 114 uh, which was a multi-decade low up to where we are at the moment which is coming in toward a 128 handle is what if we do get to a point where this game of uh, brinksmanship between the UK and Europe going into that deadline at the end of the month doesn't materialize in anything and the fact then that increases in the risk of potential no deal being back on the table uh, many other speed bumps to obviously encounter before that would inevitably become the case but do you would you then the pound be somewhat susceptible given its market positioning and the relative complacency at this point in time uh, of that that no deal risk being priced in which you would say in this extent is very little at this point so yeah, a couple of interesting things just to have a think about on the I guess slightly longer time horizon but at the moment intraday yeah, currency markets, the pairs here, euro dollar and cable top left, supported by the weaker dollar. The Dixie in itself this morning, taking a bit of a dip as Europe's come in, it's down about two tenths of 1%. Uh, and gold then up about four bucks, not too far off the high print that was seen yesterday afternoon, trading about four dollars shy of that at the moment. And the 10 year has basically just held on to some of the movement that was seen during the earlier part of the week. Fairly quiet session overall yesterday obviously a lot of market participants are awaiting the FOMC later this evening so just discussing a couple of things I want to run you through some of the headlines and what people are talking about and, and this is obviously one of the main talking points at the moment is this kind of uh, the extreme nature of the the recovery that we've had from the initial pandemic lows that we were seeing in that stock market route in the middle of March and this is kind of one of the lead headlines from Bloomberg. So I just wanted to run through a couple of the points of which they're making. And they're talking about, I mean, their headline in itself doesn't doesn't get more sensational than that, really. Signs the stock market rally is doomed to end. It's kind of famous last words for making me want to get long in, <laughs> in some respects, because uh, as we've seen, you know, the kind of the hedge fund managers calling this wrong uh, a couple of weeks ago when they were all calling for the top uh, and the market's gone multiple percentage points higher uh, and now you're getting this type of headline. And uh, yeah, certainly there's a couple of indicators here, as I'll show you, that would suggest that there is substance to this, this kind of argument. Um, JP Morgan for one they're talking about the risk of correction to rise if good news rapidly priced in and I do think that is a good point if you think about it 
you know, what is underlying this recovery in equities? Well, really, it's this kind of everything in the kitchen sink mentality from central banks and governments to just really conduct an unprecedented level of support for the global economy. Uh, and so therefore, there's a degree now of of positivity priced in for what the, the type of recovery that we should be seeing on the back of the, the scale of the intervention that we've had. Uh, that as well in step with the fact that from the coronavirus point of view, I was reading uh, Anthony Fauci, the, the US corona advisor, still very downbeat, he always has been, but so far there has been probably not as um, the kind of tracking of the cases of new coronavirus confirmed cases um, after the initial peak and decline that we've had, uh, the materialising of a secondary wave really hasn't happened as yet. And as I've said before, I do still see that as one of the key potential risks going forward, particularly given market pricing right now where we are. But at the moment, if it if it doesn't happen, if it never happens, well then, you know, markets are kind of reflecting that. And that's partly part of the reason why we continue to move higher. So definitely the more good news gets priced in, the more good news needs to be delivered. And if it's not, then that's not meeting expectations and markets do need to come off. So I do see what JP Morgan is saying there. Um, a, few of the, a few of the graphics then and indicators that this article looks at. One is you know, the kind of extreme nature of what the 12 month forward price to earnings ratios are looking like at the moment. Um, that would suggest that global stocks are trading at their highest valuation since 2002 at this present point in time, as you can see here, well and above anything that we've seen in, in recent years, um, and also above those highs that we had in kind of late 2004. Um, daily moving averages, when we're looking at the MSCI, uh, so the kind of world index is, you know, we're way above that at the moment, all on all three measures on the 50, 100 and 200. Um, so, you know, is this indicative of it being overbought? If you were looking at the relative strength index, there could be some suggestions that that is the case at the moment. Um, and then there's a few other things here. I've, uh, I've got some notes here uh, of quite an interesting statistic that I've seen in the options market. Uh, and it was basically suggesting that traders have established fresh bullish positions. And this was looking last week. This article actually did come out last week, but it's another thing to be aware of. So traders established fresh bullish positions last week by buying uh, around 35 and a half million new call options on equities. And that's up from a peak of 28.7 million in February, as you can see on the chart. Um, at the heart of the speculative activity, uh, when you scratch beneath the surface, is smaller investors uh, small trader call buying made up 50% of the total volume last week, the higher since 2000. Um, past instances where bullish small trader positions made up 45% or more of the volume preceded a median loss for US stocks of around 3% in two months time and 15% in a year. So it's one of those age old sayings in, in, in professional trading, which is you know when the retail market starts getting overtly, let's say, long in this instance. It's kind of like the telltale sign that a market rally's hit its peak when uh, retail people start sniffing around. And, you know, definitely, I mean, I've uh, been getting slightly caught up in some of these headlines about uh, the Robin Hood kind of euphoria that's happening at the moment. And these guys kind of picking up these basically bankrupt firms like Hertz, for example, what is it? It's rallied something like 800% or something crazy like that. You know, these companies which have filed for bankruptcy, which, you know, these people kind of just taking a punt, basically, that they're so depreciated in their value. But what if something happened and there was a last minute way of just baining them out and you could get humongous returns on their stock price? And people in that kind of new, I guess, the, the investor in a Robin Hood sense is slightly different in terms of its demographic uh, and you know the ability then for the, the, the perception to spread and people just start flying into these stocks without really looking too much at the underlying kind of balance sheet fundamentals more so just chasing these kind of you know the the rumor mongering in that sense trying to look for the next big kind of golden ticket returns 
So yeah, it, that's another interesting thing. Uh, I guess I'll summarize all of this. I saw a really great comment from a chap at uh, Rabobank, and he said that if everyone is holding stocks just to pass on the next ne on to the next greater fall, and if the greatest fall is a central bank with infinite liquidity to buy them, then sure, prices can keep going up. Uh, and you know, this is one of the things that my colleague Eddie has mentioned in some of the videos that he's done in uh, that you can find on our YouTube channel. But you know, it's one of those things where if if the Fed start, you know, they're going in every possible length to support the economy, and if the the last the buyer of last resort is the Fed, well then, <laughs> who's to say that stocks can't continue to go higher? So, yeah, it's interesting at the moment. Um, certainly. Um, I guess what I'll be looking for is even if the market does eventually peter out and you know sometimes this can be uh, behavioral in a sense of big round figures targets now the Nasdaq's at 10,000 that's pretty interesting I guess for you know first time ever at these double digit kind of 10,000 increment is that a reason for a bit of just you know profit taking you know this is how that human kind of rational mind tries to make sense of these types of things the point being is is that you know without an escalation in confirmed corona cases or the trade war i would say that even if we did see a bit of a pullback i would actually see that more of a consolidation at this point rather than a, a complete breakdown in markets where we see something akin to what we had a couple of weeks ago in march that uh, would be my overall summary. All right, well, let's move on. Uh, as I said, uh, I'll put a link on, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, into the video description to, to register for the event. I'll be covering the Fed live this evening, so I'd absolutely love to have you on board, and you can ask me any questions that you have uh, in the run-up to that. So I'll be joined by some of the other members of the team as well who'll be trading the event. Uh, but let me give you a summary. Uh, the central bank basically... Uh, well, People are looking out for them to outline or shed more light uh, on the various lending plans that they have at the moment. Uh, unlikely that they're going to intonate towards any further easing. That seems to be the job done for the time being, at least for the current um, economic situation. Um, but I guess more detail. Uh, one of the things that they're going to be um, unveiling later tonight is their... Uh, the kind of summary of economic projections, their outlook or forward guidance that they give. Um, and that means then looking into what do they see employment, what do they see their growth targets looking like over the end of the year and the subsequent years thereafter. And that gives us an idea then of where we can anticipate rates to start to come off kind of ground zero. At the moment, the latest um, economists survey that's been conducted by Bloomberg, they say that the FOMC is likely to project that it will raise rates only in 2022, uh, while some see no hikes before 2023 or later. So this kind of uh, zero interest rate policy is here to stay for the foreseeable future. Uh, that I have no doubt in. Um, the FOMC, if you remember, they took the unusual step of suspending their forecasts in March um, so remember, there's eight interest rate meetings from the Fed every year, every alternate meeting. So in the US, it falls on every end of calendar kind of quarter. So March, June, SEP, DEC, they'll release these projections. Um, they suspended March because of the fact that it was right in the middle of the, the pandemic kicking off. And it was zero visibility, really, that they had the the forecast would have been null and void the moment they were written at that point. So this is going to be the first real concrete uh, tangible update to these forecasts since going back uh, right to the beginning of the, of, of the year uh, in that sense or to the end of last year so they're definitely going to be some radical changes for sure um, Powell did say at the time the, the projections would be released in June uh, might they not release it uh, perhaps but I, I, I think the central bank's job is to provide some form of um, of guidance to what the future looks like and that's a very important part of companies having that uh, being able to visualize what that looks like in order for them to make some decisions uh, about you know uh, how they operate uh, and who they employ and so on uh, in terms of uh, the importance for their recovery I think that the Fed has no other choice but to offer this guidance um, the Fed <laughs> Can though, um, you know, from a market reaction point of view, 
the the projections you'll like to see are going to be pretty dire. Um, don't forget that they're going to go through a radical shakeup given the fact that the existing projections are so outdated. However, remember markets are forward looking and you know as we saw with the ECB looking for a contraction of somewhere in, in the likes of 8% for this year they then look for a sharp recovery of i think it was 5% uh, the following year so it's the idea there that you know for the ECB it was a revision from around 0.8 to negative 8% massive but the markets were actually focusing on well that's okay we know that what are, what is the future looking like so that's what's going to be important for Jerome Powell and perhaps the press conference will hold the key then to, to how optimistic he now is about all of the different things in which the Fed have deployed and, and, and how effective that is going to be going forward in time. And how does he see the shape of that recovery looking like and over what time horizon uh, will be important. Um, the committee is likely to discuss clarifying the, the, the kind of monetary policy intentions, including um, targeting yields for some treasury maturities or otherwise known as yield curve control which has been adopted by some other major central banks uh, economists do expect the committee to adopt this tactic but most say that they'll probably wait for september for an announcement um, the fed is currently purchasing treasuries in mortgage backed securities uh, in the amounts needed there are also a couple of suggestions from some analysts that they could increase that figure on the monthly purchases uh, I'd probably see that as less of the case right now because markets seemingly are functioning okay for the moment in terms of there's no you know great panic being observed and so I don't really see the need for adding too much more beyond the more functional liquidity kind of programs and the things like the Main Street Lending Program changes which they did yesterday I think are more probably appropriate for the time being. Uh, the bottom line here is we can expect the Fed to kind of re-emphasize their willingness and readiness um, to use a full range of tools to support the economy. Uh, that's kind of the main thing. Uh, but we'll go into this a lot more detail later. Uh, a few other headlines just to round things off. Um, this was an exclusive in, in Reuters this morning. Sticking with the central banks, the European Central Bank officials are drawing up apparently a scheme to cope with potentially hundreds of billions of euros of unpaid loans in the wake of the coronavirus outbreak, according to two people familiar with the matter. So the ECB preparing effectively a bad bank to buy up um, the, what is expected to be a wave of coronavirus toxic debt. Um, just look at the charts this morning to tell you that this isn't an immediate market mover at this point in time. I don't think it's really particularly surprising thing just given the, the state of which uh, the corporate environment is at the moment and so uh, I guess this is just the next logical evolution of what it is that, they, that they've been doing so yeah I wouldn't really be factoring this too much in for any short-term trading decisions in the European assets. Overnight we did have some Chinese inflation uh, metrics come out um, and a few things to be aware of I guess uh, for one we had Factory deflation deepened in May amid um, a slow recovery. So CPI year on year came in at 2.4%. Expectations were for 27 The PPI came in at a negative 3.7%. Expectations were for a negative 3.3%. So both figures lower than anticipated. Um, demand remains weak, essentially, is what that information is telling you. Uh, the factory gate deflation dropping uh, to its lowest in almost four years. Uh, that's bad news for corporate, corporate profitability, investment, employment. So despite everything the Chinese central bank and the government have tried to do in order to stimulate the economy, it still uh, isn't having a, a potent effect, albeit it has helped stabilize their market. Um, so pork inflation slows. Remember, that was incredibly high just given the African pig swine flu that was uh, affecting pork prices and this was even before everything started happening with the pandemic uh, and as as I've said there producer price is falling the fastest since March 2016 so is there much to read into this even though the week had expected my overall assessment is no not not really not for not for this morning's open at least um, it just goes to show then that the pressure is probably likely to be on the Chinese authorities to continue helping supporting the um, their local economy going forward so you know if you hear any more rhetoric out of the central bank it's probably going to be something along those means 
uh, in order to counteract this type of thing. But it just goes to show that you know China, who are several stages ahead, you could say, in terms of where they're at with this coronavirus post the peak, they are still um, going through quite a, a slow, protracted, arduous process of, of getting their feet back under the table again. You know, and is that uh, indicative of, of, of what other countries are going to see? Um, who are further behind on that kind of uh, infections curve. Yeah, this is just a look at, at those figures, uh, which we've just discussed. Uh, so the CPI, you can see here dipping uh, after that elevation that we saw, but uh, predominantly based on the back of uh, an acceleration in food prices in particular at the beginning of the year, going into the Lunar New Year, New year period. However, obviously demand dropping dramatically during the pandemic. So both those numbers moving lower and probably the more worrying one more reflective of their economy, giving an export dependency on manufacturing is the PPI decline. Overnight, you had the oil inventory numbers. Uh, just a quick look at how the initial reaction here, it was it was pretty tame, to be honest. Uh, we had a bit of a downtick here uh, at the time the numbers came out. So in WTI crude futures, what were those numbers? Well, we had a crude build, uh, fairly sizable comparative to what market expectations were of 8.42 million. Uh, expectations were for a draw of around a million. Uh, Cushing and draw 2.285 million gasoline, just shy of 3 million distillate, uh, just over 4.27 million. One thing that what I was looking at yesterday uh, was the tropical storm uh, Cristobal. However, that now is the basically has continued to dissipate as it's moved further inland, so it's now just the remnants of in that respect. Uh, the latest update I was reading last night, and, you know, it's moved on considerably, is that U.S. Gulf of Mexico oil producers, so down in this region here, have returned about 60,000 barrels per day back into service after about 35% of the Gulf's oil and gas production was temporarily taken offline uh, when that uh, previous tropical storm was passing through that region. So I'd anticipate then uh, that also they'll be bringing more and more back online uh, as we go forward through the next 24 hours. Um, the NHC website, obviously something that needs tracking at this type of time of year. Uh, you can see here there is now a uh, disturbance taking place within the Atlantic with a 10% chance of a cyclone, cyclone formation in 48 hours. Probably a little bit early yet to see its uh, projected direction, but perhaps something else to keep an eye on as we go through the next coming days. Looking at the calendar for today, um, it is actually particularly quiet for the morning. Uh, there's no actual major UK European data coming so it's very much a, a US centric session with the focus of course on the Fed later on this evening. You do have US CPI coming out um, again similar to other inflation readings that we're seeing around the globe at the moment just given the lockdowns that have been in place can expect demand to be reflective of that and so CPI is expected to decrease slightly. The year on year in the US expected at 0.2%, the core year on year expected at 1.3%. The DOE oil, oil infantry levels will obviously come out later uh, and now just using that as a reference point with the quite large build that we had um, as our baseline expectation for when the DOEs hit and then you've got the Fed coming later. Speaker wise, ECB Schnabel, uh, Vice President de Guindos speaking midday and this afternoon and of course we'll be monitoring with great interest the press conference with Jerome Powell at 7.30 London time, so 1.30 if you're in Chicago. That is it. Any questions, please do feel free to leave a comment. Let me know. Uh, hope that was informative. Uh, remember to like and subscribe to the YouTube channel if you're watching this there. And I'll see you same time tomorrow. Thanks very much.